so thank you, you know, first of all. Um, let's talk about where you are right now. People are calling you one of the most dynamic young actors in America, or just actors, period. Let's drop the word young. You know, you're doing your thing. How do you feel when you get all these accolades about your work? And, and, and you know, um, you said you started when you were 11 years old, but here you are now about to be in this major Marvel film called Black Panther. Oh, man. That's a... Uh... It's epic, man. I guess because in the beginning, I never really started. I never started off acting. I never got into the industry on purpose. It, it, it was something that just kind of happened, you know. Uh, you know, I've told the story a million times. But my mom, you know, she was at a doctor's appointment. Uh, she had she has lupus, and uh, you know, I was sitting in the waiting room, and the you know the you know. The, the receptionist was like, you know, you should get your son into modeling because she had two boys that was in the industry. So mm -hmm. I went and crashed one of their auditions and I booked the first one that I went out on and it just was like a snowball effect. It just went from one thing to the next. And I never really, you know, as a kid, I didn't really, you know, you know, always dream or watch movies and be like, you know, I want to be an actor or anything like that. I was just, you know, I was so young at the time, I was just being a kid and it just kind of evolved. So, you know, when I get all these acc accolades and, <clears throat> and all these achievements, it's kind of surreal, you know. Um, I think for a long time I used to feel I used to feel like I, I didn't deserve it. I used to feel like it, it wasn't, you know, like 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 why me? Like mm. all my friends and uh, peers and stuff growing up, you know, we had the same kind of life and you know could have made the same choices and walked the same streets and you know did a lot of the same things. Like why did I go this way? And you know and and you know, you know out of everybody else and it's uh it's uh. Yeah, it's kind of surreal, man, because I fell, I fell in love with acting. I learned to appreciate the craft, you know, and, um, you know, the art of st telling stories. And, um, and you started, you know, where you, you have like this bi-coastal life that you've had, California and the East Coast. Yep. Where did this happen? Were you in the doctor's office with your mother? Was that California? I was in, I was in, I was in New Jersey. Okay, what part yeah, of so New Jersey? I, it was, I was in New York, New Jersey. Oh, yeah, Bricks. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, Brick City. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember exactly where the mm. doctor's appointment was, but it, it, it was in, uh, yeah, it was it was on the East Coast. I was born in, uh, in Orange County until uh, I was two, and then I moved to New Jersey, okay. and then I was out there until I was about 18, 19, and then moved back out here and been here ever since. Okay. Yeah. What was the first acting thing you did then? First acting job, um, it might have been a PSA for like Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Mm. It was something like super small. Commercial. Commercial. Like it was like a PSA. I don't even think it ever aired on TV. I think it only ran within like the Big Brother, Big Sister kind of mm. like organization mm. internally or whatnot. Right. Uh, but I was on The Sopranos as like, you know, background extra work. Late I was 90s, like, yeah, early yeah, 2000, okay. Exactly, yeah. Something like that. and. Um, did a lot of print work, you know, mm. for like the Sunday paper, you know, models and Toys R Us and all these little like you were you know, in all those things. Frito Lay and Doritos, little like you know. So the, the work like, was happening. I've always had an early level of some type of success, you know. It was, and that's kind of I think as a kid what kept me going. It was mm. like, oh man, I'm kind of good at this, and let's see, you know, what's next and what's next, what's around that corner, what's what's going on, and you know, all those small little successes just mm. kind of added up to this this path that I was on. So when was the first time you actually used the word actor to describe yourself then? Man, probably, probably on All My Children. I think it was probably right around the time I, you know, I joined the soaps. It, it was uh, after The Wire, I got killed off The Wire, and then immediately after I, I went on this audition in New York, you know, for, for All My Children, and I, and I got it. And, you know, I went to the daytime Emmys a lot, you know, and, and you know, How old were you? 16? 16 years old. 16? Okay. Yeah, I was, I was about 16. And um, yeah, I think that was the first time I ever kind of like owned up to what I was doing. Up until, uh, I guess The Wire was the first time I fell in love with acting, you know, like, towards the end of the show. I, I was like, okay. This is something that I might be able to do for a living. You know, all the older veteran actors like, you know, Idris Elba and, you know, Dominic West and Andre Royal, which who you know I credit a lot of uh, you know my drive and kind of uh, you know just the you know the man. This is an option for me. You know, acting maybe I can make a career out of this. You know, he he kind of put that put that you know planted that seed in me. And uh, yeah, so I think that was the first time I kind of like owned up and was like, you know what, I, I'm an actor. But still had the fear that it was always going to go away or I didn't think I was, I mean, I never saw this hmm. ever happening. How did your, your peers growing up respond to 
hey, that's him in an ad. That's him on TV. That's him on a soap opera. How did they respond to you? I think my, my close friends always gave me shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think they always, they always kind of, you know, you know, busted my chops. Right. And, and, uh, and uh, cause you know, I was on a, so I was on a soap opera, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it was like, you know, just the, the stereotype, you know, stereotypical kind of like, you know, soap operas, you know, might be over dramatic or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they always used to give me, give me crap about it. And, uh, and, but then I was always working, you know, they always, I guess they always respected the hustle, you know, they always respected that, you know, I was working and I was doing something and I, I, I made a choice really young to uh, kind of lock in and, uh, and try to see this thing through. But you were going to school, regular schools and everything. You weren't out of school per se for. No, the first two years of uh, high school, I was, I was in high school. I was in, uh, went to Arts High in Newark, New Jersey. And the last two years I got homeschooled okay. because I was just working so much. Mm. It, uh, I was missing so many days of school. And you know, that environment, they really encouraged, you know, their students to pursue, you know, the, yeah. the, the arts and, uh, the, you know, arts and, and, you know, and hone in their craft. So I had two hours a day of my major, you know, and then I started getting homeschooled. And it really, at that point, I really kind of made a decision that I wasn't going to college and I was going to like kind of pursue this thing full force and mm. planned on moving out to LA when I graduated high school and wow. you know, just to see this thing through. And, you know, my parents always really supported me, but my dad was always the one that, you know, you know, he, acting always kind of came easy to me, mm. you know? And I, I don't think he saw me in his eyes at the time, saw me really uh, taking it seriously in his mind. And uh, he always tell me, you need to take, you need to take it seriously. You need to take something seriously, no matter what it is, just take it seriously. And, uh, and then eventually when I, you know, when I, that kind of clicked to me in my head and, and I really, uh, I really started to, you know, kind of see the pieces and kind of mm -hmm. was able to see, man, if I did this and I do this and maybe in that and, and anything that's not conventional, you know, that's not your, you know, your typical career path, or, you know, you're not your average career path, you know, you, you got to trick yourself into believing you're doing what you're supposed to do. Like you almost have to like, you know, you know, having faith in yourself and having hope, you know, having faith, you know, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing is one thing, but you got to believe that this is your destiny and this is what you're supposed to be doing in life, you know, if you really want it, you know, and um, yeah, that's what I had to do. Family, um, I get the impression you come from a very close-knit, supportive family. Can mm -hmm. you talk about how important family was for you growing up, especially yeah. given this non-conventional life that you had? Yeah, family was super important to me. Like my mom and dad, you know, they've been together 30 years, 33 years, I'm sorry, um, for a really long time. And just growing up, my dad, you know, always, and my mom, they always set the example of, you know, family first. You take care of your family, you take care of your family, you take care of your family. Like, this is our support group. You know, we, 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 we hold each other accountable and we hold each other up. You know, mm -hmm. this is, this is, that, that's, you know, it was instilled to me as a kid. You know, I celebrated Kwanzaa growing up. Wow. Like, it was just like, you know, the, you know, seven principles. It was things that was just always, you know, around me. And, um, and then especially when I started, you know, down this, you know, in the industry, you know, of course, my parents must have heard a million horror stories and, you know, the industry's this and the industry's that. And um, to kind of give them the reassurance that their son had their head on straight and mm -hmm. wasn't going to get kind of like, you know, tempted by any of the, you know, pitfalls of, uh, of the entertainment industry. You know, we all definitely relied on each other to kind of like push through. And yeah, like mom used to you know, drive me to set it, all the auditions. She was a stage mom, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying, for a really long time. And, you know, if, if she couldn't go, then one of my, you know, my aunts would, would, would take me. My aunt couldn't go, maybe one of my uncles would take me. You know, it was, like, it was, it was definitely everybody kind of pitched in and helped me kind of, you know, kind of pursue this. And you have two siblings. Yes. Where, where you are, where are you in the... I'm the middle. I'm okay. the middle child. I have an older sister, uh, Jamila, and a younger brother, Khaled. Okay. You know? and, are, uh, are they artists as well? They're all in the arts as well, you know, um, more on the production, um, creative side. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm the guy that was in, you know, that, that just so happened to be in front of the camera. Um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that just worked. It just worked out because I guess I, I was into it first. Like my sister, you know, she went to you know Temple University. She got you know television communications. Mm. You know, my brother did the same thing. But I guess my early success at some point, you know, might have kind of we all kind of somewhat fell into the same industry somewhat. Mm. And uh, yeah. So, who did you love as an actor when you were coming up? as a young actor, as a child actor, as a teenage actor, who did you absolutely love? 
and say, this is the path that I want to go on. You know, the funny thing is, I didn't have that many. I, I, I didn't have anyone as a kid growing up. I, I was really more into cartoons. Mm, what cartoons? And animation, like Dragon Ball Z and like DuckTales and, you know, and all the, the Disney vault, you know what I'm saying? Like any Disney movies. Like I was, I was the kid that was, you know, you know, watching anime, mm. you know, and, and comic books and, and, and that type of thing. And, and, but then I always could appreciate films, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, like the Bad Boys and, you know, Armageddon and you know, uh, you know, you know, Rounders and uh, uh, even you know, I even watched movies I wasn't supposed to, like Scarface and you know, and uh, you know, The Godfathers and mm. stuff like that and Fry Fry. You know, I, I eventually started to you know peel off into everything. So, but I think it always started like my imagination, the fantasy element. You know, like it was always in the like you know, cartoons mm. and, and, and anime and video games and stuff like that. That's kind of where it all started. But then it uh, it branched out into you know, just storytelling mm. in, gen in general. You, so I'm trying to understand because I've, I've looked it up, but how do you have the roots in both California and New Jersey? How did that happen? My dad's from California. Okay. He's from South Central. Okay. Crenshaw, um, with all my uncles and stuff like that. And my mom's from New Jersey. She moved to LA when she was 19, 20. Uh, met my dad. That's how it happened. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. They fell in love, you know, the whole thing. Had my sister, had me, okay. you know, then we moved out to, you know, uh, Jersey. Uh, to be around my mother's parent, my mother's uh, mother, my grandmother, hmm. and um, and you know, because it takes a village, you yeah. know. And I think the support system on the East Coast, you know, from my mom, you know, was was important as a family. And they made a decision, and we went out east, hmm. and you know, that's hmm. that's where we were raised. So that's kind of how it's always been bi-coastal. So, you know, oddly enough, I have my dad's side of the family and some of my mom's side of the family out here in LA, and then I have a lot of my mom's family out on the East Coast too. Mm. So I've always, you know, summer vacations, basketball camps, I've always kind of came, family reunions, always went out to the to the West Coast growing up, and it was something about LA. I always knew I was going to move out here eventually. Mm. I just didn't know for what, and it just so happened it had to be for exactly. this stuff. Yeah. So you finish high school. Finish high school. 18 years old. 18 years you old. You like, I'm, I'm coming out here. Moving to LA. Did you come by yourself? I came by myself like the first six months. First six months I moved out. Uh, then a buddy of mine, uh, one of my best friends, older brother, uh, moved out with me a little bit after that. And yeah, man, I mean, it, it, was, it was tough, you know? Um, How so? Because, I mean, I wasn't, I, I was working, but I wasn't working enough. Like, I, I didn't really understand, like, what it really took to sustain, like, a life, you know, off of an actor's salary when you're not really, like, you know, a successful actor. Yeah, like, yeah, I was on notable shows at mm -hmm. the time that people knew who I was. Or like, oh, that's the guy. I mean, did we go to school together? Or, I mean, yeah, you look familiar. Like, who's that? Oh, yeah, that's the guy from The Wire or whatever. But that type of... Uh, notability, you know, doesn't really translate into financial stability. <laughs> <laughs> so what did kinda, you do? Ah, oh, man, I mean, go for broke. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was blessed enough to kind of like after I got each job, you know, that whatever that check was would last me enough to, mm -hmm. you know, where I would doubt and hope and get nervous and be like, oh, man, I got to move back to Jersey and then I will book something. Mm. It would keep me there for a little bit longer. Like right when I was getting ready to give up, it was always something that kept me there for mm. a little bit longer. Um, you know, sleeping on my boy's couch, you know, and staying with friends. And, and I was blessed to really have, you know, a lot of friends out here in L.A., you know, growing up that were like family and really, really helped me out, yeah. you know what I'm saying, and gave me that kind of comfort, you know what I'm saying, to to withstand a storm. You know, I remember me and one of my best friends, Sterling, you know, we used to go to, we went to Jack in the Box and try, you know, we were so broke and um, we, we went out, you know, filled out, tried to fill out job applications, you know what I'm saying, and work at Jack in the Box. This, like is after, this is after the wire, this is after all that, after you know what I'm saying? Wire. Oh man, all that, man. It was to the point where we were just like, man, we just gotta do what we gotta do. It's like, you know, second of our pride, man, we're gonna do it together, man, don't worry about it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And uh, and so we were overqualified. You were overqualified. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't get the job. We were overqualified. So it was. They actually know, told you that. Yeah, without a doubt. They were like, man, like basically, like, what y'all doing here? And I think one of the guys back there, like, kind of knew who I was too. You know what I'm saying? In a sense, and it was just like one of those humbling, humbling, humbling experiences, man. Hmm. I mean, even after all that, man, I remember uh, I was a stand-in for uh, for for uh, I think it was for like a Nike commercial or a print ad. It was like for a Nike print ad back in the day 
and I was a stand-in, you know what I'm saying? After, you know what I'm talking about, after a working actor, after mm -hmm. like being at the daytime Emmys and doing this and doing that and, you know, being on the wire and all this, all this stuff and, and still had to humble myself enough to like do what I had to do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, man, it, it, was, it was tough, but in my head it was like, what, like I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What what was the bridge that got you past that period of just you know how am I gonna get pet how am I gonna make it here how am I gonna actually earn a living on a regular basis as an actor when Man. did it really hit for you I mean I remember getting ready I gave my last check savings and everything you know um, it was a. Uh, yeah, I was getting ready. You call it quits. I was like, "This is it, last month." You know, uh -huh. it was right around like September, like September two thousand eight. September two thousand eight. So you were about twenty, twenty-one years old. Twenty-one years old or so. Twenty-one. Yeah. And uh, and it was an audition that came up. No, I went. To, I went to this uh, this guy named Anthony Hemingway. Yeah. Yeah, Anthony the Hemingway. Director, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And um, went to his house. With, uh, right, it was. It was right. It was September, but it was right before Thanksgiving. I went over his house for Thanksgiving mm -hmm. dinner. And uh, and I knew he was up for this movie, Red Tails, uh, with George Lucas and stuff like that. And, and you know, he told me, you know, he was going, you know, he's gonna get me in on it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Give me, a, you know, audition. And, and in my head, it was like, yeah, you know, hopefully, you know what right. I'm saying? Hopefully it's gonna work, you know what right. I mean? Or hopefully I'm gonna get this job or whatever. <laughs> but that was the job that gave me enough money to stay in LA, you know? Um, you know, I remember all of us over his house, it's me, uh, <coughs> Excuse Nate me. Parker, David Oyelowo, um, it was uh, uh, Elijah, uh, Elijah Kelly, um, Tristan Wilds, it was all of us, man. We were just over, Leslie Odom Jr. Um, we that's, were, so, that's right, yeah, Leslie. Leslie. Yeah, man. Hamilton. Yeah, exactly, wow. man. Yeah, we were all in there, man. And, and it was one of those things where Anthony was like, you know, this is this is the squad, this is what we're gonna go do, something epic, you know, working with George Lucas, mm. you know, go, you know, go shoot over in Prague, overseas, the whole thing. And, and um, yeah, that movie saved me. Mm. You know, that movie allowed me to stay in LA. And then after that, when I got back, it was just one after another. Yeah. You know, things just kept going, episodics, uh, you know, Friday Night Lights. Did that for a couple seasons, did Parenthood, you know, Chronicle, Parenthood, you know, like you say, it, just, it, yeah. just, it just started to roll after that. And um, yeah, 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 so that was, the, that was the turning point for me was Red Tails. So tell me about your, I mean, your process, because you've played a wide range of characters. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of process that, you know, like a lot of actors would say, well, this is my process of getting into character. What is it yeah. for you? And when did it start for you to kind of really, you know, immerse yourself in the character and really think about it in that way? I think, you know, I don't think I, I, don't think I had a process until, until I did Red Tails with uh, Nate Parker. He's an extremely hardworking person, um, and he gave me a he gave me a he gave me the idea of writing a journal, a backstory. Hmm. So, um, and from that point on, I would write journals for all my characters. Like the earliest memory that I could think about, up until the first page of the script, that's what I would do, and. Um, and that became my process over time, you know? Um, up until that point, it was kind of imitating natural talent, you know, mm -hmm. God-given talent, you know what I'm saying? It was just things that I was just kind of like, you know, just trying to make it as real as possible. What would I do if I was in a situation and just go ahead and convey that as best I could? But that extra layer of like becoming and creating this, this fictional person, this other guy was like creating this, these journals for characters and that's what I've done ever since. How did it work for Fruitville Station, which is where I, as I said to you off camera, first mm -hmm. really, really, really said, oh, you know, and I've seen you before, but mm -hmm. how did it work for that particular role? Um, that one I didn't really write a journal for because mm. it was, uh, I couldn't really make up things in my head about what his past was. Yeah. I, I, I really had to get to know him through the people that knew him the best, yeah. you know, um, his mom, uh, his best friends, his daughter, you know, uh, mm. mother of his child, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and really had to capture that as best I could. So I spent a lot of time up in Oakland um, and really tried to, tried to embody him as best I could and like just get the, the essence of who Oscar was, mm. you know, and try to you know, pray to him, you know what I'm saying? Ask him to kind of be around me and be with me as I was kind of like telling the story and stuff. So yeah, that was my process on Fruitville. I mean, you 
That was an incredible performance. Um, did you become him? You felt in moments, yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was Oscar for sure. You yeah. know, like I, I, it was a, uh, yeah, you know, changing the way I, you know, think. You know, I walk, talk. Yeah, I mean that was that was that was the first time. Mm, I can't say the first time, but that was that was the first real time that I spent an extended period of time in character. Mm. Um, and it's like a muscle, you know. You, you know, first time out the gate, you're not gonna, you know, for me anyway. Yeah. You got to keep flexing and working that muscle out, and you stay in it a little bit longer. You stay in it for stretches, you know, for stretches, even longer stretches, and even longer stretches, even longer stretches, and you know, that's that that's that, that was how it worked for me. Mm. You know, you make me think about Daniel Day Lewis, who said they said he would never come out of character. Never. <laughs> oh man, yeah, Daniel's the guy, man. He's 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 solid, super method, really yeah. does it. You know, so that that's, you know, to get on that level, is uh, is is, is uh, incredible. Um, but yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. That that's not necessarily my my process. And every role for me, you know, it's hard to do that. Yeah. Now it's it's getting it's different circumstances because. Bigger roles, um, more complex roles, mm. more meat on the bones, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. More things to work with when you're yeah. younger, you know, you're doing little episodics here, this and that, you know, it's really hard to like, you know, really try to like become somebody else mm. in these little moments and stuff like that, but yeah. So that role happened and both you and Ryan Coogler, who's a great, great director, have a lot of respect for him as well. I started hearing people saying, oh, this is, um, Scorsese and De Niro. Mm. You heard it too. Yeah. How do you feel when you hear things like that? You know, people are saying you're De Niro, he's Scorsese, you know? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, shit, man. That's, that's, a, that's a, I mean, those guys been making movies shit, longer than I was alive, man. It's yeah. crazy. But uh, it's, um, I mean, it's an incredible, you know, honor, man. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge compliment. You know, I feel like, you know, with directors, you, I mean, you can see anybody, you know, you, work, you find a director that finds their muse, you know, somebody that they have a shorthand with, and it's, you know, it's just easier when you're on set, you know, to be able to communicate with somebody and, you know, you know, anybody that's shot a movie, you know, time is money, you know, and you're always watching that clock, you know, those days, trying to get those shots in, those takes in, trying to move on to the next thing. So if you can have an actor that, you know, is talented and do his thing and you guys have a relationship and a rapport, you want to keep going back to that well, you know, you want to keep working with that guy, you know what I'm saying, continue. So me and him connected on a, you know, on a personal level, you know, on, on, a, on, a, um, on a business level, you know, on a work level, uh, on a human level, you know, we're from similar places. He's from, you know, Richmond, from, you know, from the Bay, I'm from Newark, New Jersey. Yeah. We care about family, we love telling stories, we love filming, and, and, and for me, you know, as an actor, you know, I, I was one piece of the puzzle how to tell the stories I want to tell and you know do the movies I want to do I need a writer director that's able to help convey that you know that to use me and put me in those roles so we linked up at a at a perfect time in my life and our careers and, and and we and we've been we've been mobbing out ever since how did you meet I met Ryan when I was coming back from shooting Chronicle in South Africa okay. it was right around the time Trayvon Martin got shot mm. and I remember uh you know, me feeling sick, you know, and wanting to, you know, express myself as best I could. But as an actor, especially, you know, a black actor, you know, being political and speaking out on issues at that time, you know, I felt a little nervous to really like speak my truth. Mm. Um, I felt like, you know, it, it was really, it was really tough. And uh, I remember, po you know, writing stuff on Facebook, deleting it, you know what I'm saying? I can't mm. say that, you know, doing things like, ah, oh, man, I can't. I felt some type of way. And I reached out to my agent and I was like, man, I want a role that I can show I can act. I want, I want to show, I want, I want a role that, you know, give me, just give me, I don't care if I want a gritty, independent, you know what I'm saying? Something that I could just like, just let me see if I can do it. I want to know if I could carry a film. And was you spurred by Trayvon Martin getting killed, all of this? Yeah, it all kind of happened one after another. It was like, that happened, you know, I wanted to express myself. And I remember calling him and being like, hey man, like I, I want to, you know, I want to, and not knowing this was, in the pipeline or knowing that, you know, Ryan Coogler was, you know, at the Sundance Lab writing, you know, with this script that was wow. talking to this uh, assistant that worked at the agency that my, that I was at at the time. And, you know, and, and knowing that he was going to tell her to get him, my, get my agent that script. And so these two things were happening at the same time wow. without knowing about each other. So when I said what I said, and it just so happened the script came through and, you know, I read it, it was, you know, cry, like, read it again, yeah. cried again. Yeah. I was like, man, wait till I get back to, 
you know, LA, I want to sit down and meet this guy. Sat down and met him in the Valley at Starbucks. Um, I remember at the first like 10 minutes of talking to him, I was like, all right, let's do it. I was convinced. Wow. And that's how it happened. Yeah, and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then shit, a couple weeks after that, we were talking about, uh, a week or two after that, we were talking about Creed. That fast? Yeah. I'm gonna tell you, um, I saw Fruitville. Yes, sir. In New York with one of my fraternity brothers from Texas. Mm -hmm. um, we sat there, after the movie's over, we just sat there, we both just started crying. Man. We didn't say anything, you know, because we were that blown away by the performance, Man. you know. Um, Creed. Yes, sir. You had Sylvester Stallone. Sly. How did that happen? Um, uh, how did it happen? Uh, Ryan did a lot of that work, honestly, and um, Ryan uh, really, he had a vision. He pitched it to, you know, Adam Bennett, what happened, you know, who was Sly's agent, you know? Um, and uh, So Ryan came up with the idea of resuscitating the franchise. Without a doubt. Wow. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 Ryan, you know, and you know, and, you know, Sly took some massaging, you know what I'm saying, to get him on board. You know, obviously it's his baby, you know, right. it's his franchise, things right. that he's created a long time ago. He holds very dear to him and stuff like that. And you got this young kid who never made a real movie before, before even Fruit Villa came out or anything, mm -hmm. that, you know, telling him he wants to, like, you know, do this thing about Apollo Creed's son, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you know, we went, you know, I think Ryan pitched it to him a couple of times or whatever. He still kind of said, nah, or whatever. And then Ryan went off and, you know me and Ryan went and shot the Fruit Villa. One Sundance, you know, premiered in Cannes, you know, got all these accolades, and then, you know, Sly slowly started to come around, and Creed became more real. Mm. So that that's that's kind of how that okay. went down. What did he say about Fruitville, or your performance in Fruitville? Oh, uh, I, I mean, I can't remember exactly what he said, man. But I, you know, I think I think he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I assume so. <laughs> I, 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 th I think he liked it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you're talking about one of the major movie icons of the last 40 years or so, Sly Stallone. I mean, yeah. When you realized this was happening, I mean, what was your reaction? It's weird because I guess I was a, I knew about it for so long. Yeah. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, man, my life is so crazy. Like things just happen, mm. you know? Um, yeah, I know where they come from, you right. know what I'm saying? There's certain things that are outside of my control that I just, I'm just a walk on my path and try to stay out my own way, mm. you know, some of the times. Where does it come from? I mean, you know, it's the spirit, man. The karma, the energy, the universe conspires to make a lot of these things happen. You know, that's why I try to, you know, stay a good person as I can, treat people how I want to be treated, throw that good karma and that energy out in the world, and, you know, hopefully it comes back to me. You know, that's, 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 that's kind of how I live my life. And so I, it, deep down I knew it was going to happen. So when it, when it came around, it was like, okay, hmm. it happened again. You know, it's almost like, you know, you're waiting for this thing to stop happening. Yeah. And then you get to a point and you get old enough to kind of like, you know, look at it. And it's like, nah, this is this is your path is written in, in a certain is in a certain sense. You know, you just got to you got to walk it and continue to push that shit through. It's, it's deep because you mentioned something earlier about, you know, as a, as a youth, a black, a young youth. A mm -hmm. young youth I sound like Wu-Tang Clan. Young youth. Young youth. <laughs> young, young youth. <laughs> but, you know. You're a black male in America. Yeah. And a lot of black males don't get these kind of opportunities. Yes, sir. Do you, do you suffer with some of us? I, I would add myself, you know, some of us suffer from survivor's guilt. Like, why us? Did, did you? Without a doubt. Why? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, man, because, like, you know, why me? You know, why, what? I'm, like I said, I'm from North New Jersey. I got friends and, you know, um, peers. Other actors that I think are extremely talented, you know, grew up in an audition room, see them all the time for auditioning for roles. Like, why, why me? Why am I the only one that gets this? And, you know, I used to feel a little, like, you know, animosity from, you know, other actors and, you know what I mean? From, you know, why, you know, you know, you're the one, you're the one that's getting the roles that are working and they're not as much. So it's a certain, you know, the way the industry, you know, you know, is, you know, at the, at the time and you know and, and kind of right now it's like you know it kind of naturally pits and creates this competition between mm. each other and um and it's not a friendly competitiveness it's mm. not it's not a friendly competition it, it, it becomes more uh standoffish mm. you know uh you know 
I ain't gonna say what's up to him. We can see each other at a party. I ain't gonna say hi, nah, nah. It's like nobody wants to, you know, be the one to come over and say hello. And I remember that a couple times, man. And then, you know, I, I never really felt intimidated by anybody. You know what I'm saying? I always looked at it like, what's for me is for me. And can't nobody take that away from me. What's for you is for you, and I can't take nothing away from you. I guess it kind of started me to thinking in a certain type of way of like wanting to kind of create more and kind of like not just be an actor and wanting to produce and wanting to, how do I stop? How do I fix this thing that I'm in that I don't really feel comfortable in right now? How do, how do I, how do I change that? What's mm. the, what's the long term? What's the, what's the long ball on that? How do, how do I fix this? Wow. Um, be in control of your own destiny. How do I do that? Yeah. How do I, how do I do that? So yeah, it is a little bit of survivor's remorse, you know, um, naturally. And and I don't think it you know it, it's 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 just what it what it is, yeah. um, you know you wanna. I mean usually we come from nothing. We usually come from you know, poverty. So when you get something, you usually got a lot of friends and family that you care about that you want to help also. And a lot of times that you don't have enough to help everybody. And then if you do try, you end up going back to the same position that they were in or we're mm -hmm. in and we all back sitting at each other looking at each other like what are we gonna do now <laughs> that's <laughs> real that's real man <laughs> so it's like you know for me you know I always enjoy reverse engineering things I always like seeing something like all right I know where I want to go how do I get there you know what's what's the creative what it was fun for me to find ways to get the things that I wanted what did you learn working on Creed, mm -hmm. just the film. But then what did you learn from being around Sly Stallone, who's been in this business for a long time? And he's seen the ups and downs of it all. Man, I got a lot of business sense from him, man. He, uh, he you know, he's real smart with his money. Yeah. Um, he knows audiences really well. He knows, uh, he knows filmmaking really well. You know, what makes, what makes a, you know, a good story, you know, um, how to arc out films. Uh, it's a real smart dude, and it really, uh, and he also believes in himself. You know, he 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 bet on himself. You know, through really and through. Did. You know, yeah. And and I think that's the one of the biggest things that I took from him is like you got to believe in yourself. You got to bet on yourself. Yeah. You know, um, and that and that's kind of that's kind of what that's kind of what I did. They didn't want him to place uh, Rocky in the nah. beginning. They said, like, "We'll take your script." Yeah, we'll take your script. We get his money. He's like, <laughs> he's like, "Nah, man, I can't do that." You know, did he like, share that story with you? Yeah, 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 he did, man. And it was super inspiring. You know, mm. and, and I kind of got that same spirit. I mean, you know, kind of want to, you know, bet on myself. I don't really chase money. You yeah. know, I feel like that's going to come. You know, whenever it comes. But you know, I just want to do things that I really care about. You know, and and you know roles that I, characters and movies and projects I want to be a part of. I just want to, I want to inspire, man. I want to, I want to really, I want to really, um, you know, change the, the landscape, hmm. you know, of the, of the game. Well, let's talk about that for a second. So, you know, um, as you're talking, and we talked about it off camera, mm -hmm. you know, we mentioned Sidney Poitier, we mentioned Harry Belafonte. Um, yes. You know, you're talking about two legends who turned 90 years old, you know, just in the last year. And How know, insane is that? Yeah, and they're both here. Yep. You know, um, we're from New Jersey. There's someone named Paul Robeson who came from New Jersey. Yeah, well, I know Paul. One of the great actors. Yeah, um, athletes, actors. What, you know, you said earlier that you mm -hmm. were nervous. You would erase messages you post on social media, mm -hmm. but now you want to talk about, I was told you want to talk about race. You want to talk about diversity. What has shifted for you in these few years of, of, of success and stardom and everything? And what, what platform do you feel you have now? Becoming more unapologetic. Yeah. Wow. I, I think uh, because before I wasn't that confident in myself. Mm. I think I think it was. Uh, you know, you still get a little fear of things can go away because you can lose anything at any moment. Nothing's guaranteed. Right. And I think that same notion that kind of kept me mm, really hesitant. And I'm still smart about the way things that I say and how and how I'm speak and move because the world is the world is the world is what it is, yeah. you know. Um, but I think the times are changing, where I feel the responsibility, you know, you know, of my people, my community, uh, that look to me to be an example, and um, especially through the work that I, you know, the, the work that I, that I that I do and the roles that I portray and the platform that I have that I would be doing them a disservice if I didn't speak up for, you know, 
the people that look to me for to set an example. Mm. And um and the temperature and the climate right now of, of, of the world, especially the US, is, is in a is in a, is in a crazy place. Yeah. Um the first that I've you know, the first time I've seen it, you know, usually, you know, people from the older generation can say they've seen this before. You know, this is the first time I'm going through it, I'm thirty years old, you yeah. know, and and um and the Sydney Portiers and Harry Belafontes, they've been through this already. Yeah. You know? Um and a lot worse than it is right now. So it'd be almost disrespectful to what they went through and you know, the things they sacrificed to not, you know, continue to bang down that door, to continue to, to, to pick up the baton for where they, they left off and just keep and, and keep it and keep it moving. Um, obviously, you know, the game has changed a little bit. You're not quite fighting the same as you were back then, but it's still a fight. Yeah. And um and I got to do that in my own way. How our generation is doing it right now. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. Who are your heroes and sheroes? First off, mom and dad. Mm. Off top, without goes without saying. They set the example. They gave me my mentality. That's what I'm forever thankful for. I always tell them that, man. Thank you for giving me the way I think, the way I process, the way I see the world. Cause that that's everything for me. Um, how much of a blessing is it to be able to say you have a mother and a father that are there and together? Man, it's huge. A lot yeah. of my friends ain't have that. I was the only one really growing up, back growing up with both those that were together, you know. Um, all my friends and family, you know, for the most part, they always come to my crib, you know. My dad, they all, we always cooked a lot. Yeah. Always had food at the house. Always poor, you know what I'm saying? Now looking back at it, it was extremely poor, but didn't really feel like it when I was a kid because they always found, you know, a great way. These great parents found a way to hide things from the kids. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So we definitely really feel it growing up. But, you know, my house was the house that, you know, we had Kwanzaa celebrations. Everybody would come over and, you know, eat great food and this and that and, you know, get good lessons. My dad would take us all, you know, to the Poconos, go, you know, go fishing, go camping, you know, go, you know, go out to Asbury, do things with us and stuff like that. So, you know, he, he really set an example of, you know, what a man was, you know, mm. work all night, you know, used to work nights, used to see him. You know, come home first thing in the morning, sleep, still be there for us to get up, go to school, you know, I'm gone, come back home, you won't be there. You know, just that whole thing, man. My, my parents sacrificed a lot, and my mom did as well, so it was it was it was a lot. Um But yeah, super blessed. So I wanna say my mom dad heroes for sure off top. Hmm. Um Who else do you look up to? Or have? It's crazy because I never really like looked up to a lot of celebrities or figures like that growing up because it was so far out there for me. Hmm. It was so unreachable. It was so not my world. Like, man, we're such a, it's such a big gap. Like, I, I just never really, like, you know, really looked up to anybody like that growing up. So how do you feel when people come up to you now and say, I look up to you? Michael Blow, B. Jordan. Blows my mind. I was like, me? This guy? Huh. What did I do? You know, I was like, wow. Like, yeah, I know, but it's crazy. I still like, you know, even with this whole social media thing, it's crazy. Like, you know, I got people, you know, that really care, you know, they want to they know what I'm doing, what's going on. They, they care about, you know, this stuff. And, you know, it, it still kind of blows, blows my mind that I'm that guy, that I'm now in the position to be that guy. And, and I think it's all that that's kind of, that accepting where you are, you know, coming from a place that used to be scared of success, the fear of success, of owning it, owning where you're at, owning your position, feeling like you deserve it. It all kind of goes hand in hand, you know? Mm. And I'm kind of finally, begrudgingly, with the help of my friends, family, you know what I'm saying? People that know me, that rock out with me all the time, like they, you know, they help me be the man I need to be. Mm. Um, How do you define manhood? Because you, you said your father taught you what it was to be a man. What does it mean to you now? Making smart, strong, making choices and standing behind them. Making smart choices, sacrificing things you know that are for the second, sacrificing yourself for things that are bigger than you. Hmm. You know, hmm. doing the right thing, even when nobody's looking. Hmm. Um, you know, I'm human. You know, obviously, this you know, this, it's a work in progress. Yeah. But you know I'm very self-aware and I know what my shortcomings are and I try to I try I try to address them as much as I can. Um, but uh, yeah, try just try try to try to be real, man. Try to be real. Try to be real as you know. I even try to be real. Just be 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 real, man. Just be real. And uh, 
Yeah, so my dad, my dad and uh, my mom and, you know, I've been blessed to have, you know, like I said, man, I got so many strong male figures around me, you know. Um, that kind of give me the example from all walks of life, man, like that, that just, I take a little bit from the people that, like I say it really does take a village to raise anybody, but then your community, the people you surround yourself with, you know, that you are all supposed to be learning from one another. You're all supposed to be picking, you know, from taking something from, you know, everybody's not the same, you know best friends, everybody got qualities about them that, you know, that are, that are amazing, you know, and try to, try to, try to, try to learn a little bit from everybody, try to take a little bit from everybody, be inspired a little bit from everybody, you know, um, and, and then try to just be the best version of yourself. I want to throw something at you. What's um, up? Sydney Portier came from the Bahamas, yes. South America, 1940s. Um, he was looking for a job. He was mm -hmm. hustling the way you were, young mm -hmm. man. And he saw two ads. One said dishwasher, one said actor. Mm -hmm. He picked the actor. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, about Dr. King got his PhD, young man, 26 years old. He just wanted to um, have a little church with his wife and do his thing. He landed in Montgomery, Alabama, mm -hmm. Rosa Parks, the rest is history. Some people are called to do certain things. Do you feel you were called to do what you do? Yes. Why? Don't know. Mm. Just is. Cause I could take it. I feel like uh, doing what I do, you know, acting. It's not just acting. You know, it's, you know what goes into becoming an actor. Um, people see the end result. They see the lights. They see the you know the premieres. They see the movies. They don't see the time that you put in by yourself. They don't see the the lonely journey. They don't see the auditions that you go in where you hear, you know, no, you're not this, you're not that. You don't, they don't see the moments where you're sleeping in your car. They don't see the moments where, you know, you gotta go to 7-Eleven and, you know what I'm saying, you know, and, you know, you know, dollar item this, dollar item that, you know what I'm saying, you don't, you don't, you know, when you gotta go into a gas station, swipe your car, get gas, and then hurry up and go inside a convenience store and try to get, you know, some chips and, you know, a frozen pizza or whatever before it says decline, because, you know, you ain't got that much money in your account. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, a lot, like they don't see those moments. Yeah. They don't see the, you know, the moments you stay up all night, man, you know, studying these lines, rehearsing, you know, and then you go into an audition and you don't get it again and 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 again, but somehow you still have faith and believe that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So it's like, you know, and then and then when you do get successful, you know, you do get some success, it's a now you're getting ridiculed and judged, you know, by everybody. Most of the time your own people, you know, they want to cannibalize you as much as possible. Oh, you're not this, you're not that, you're not this, you're not that, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. You know, um it's tough, you know, it's tough, but you know, for the same people that you're trying to uplift and you're trying to do things for and then being a black man in America, you know, yeah, you have, you know, a, a systemic oppression that's there, uh, a system that's put in place that is always constantly ripping you down, uh, telling you what you're not, you're not good enough, you know, color of your skin, uh, you know, you know, it's tough being a black man, you know, oh, in yeah. America, man. It's tough being, you know, this, this you know, it comes, it comes with a lot. So it's a you know, why am I chosen to do what I do? You know, I feel like it's because it's a weight I'm willing and able to bear mm. for whatever reason. And, um, and I'm still trying to figure this shit out. What's the, you know, you talked about the spotlight that's on you. Um, mm. And I've read a lot of stuff, you know, um, about you and I'm a big fan, as I said. Um, what's the biggest misconception about me, Michael B. Jordan? People just, you know, because people can say anything on social media now and it becomes the truth. Hmm. Like, what would you want to clear up that's just not accurate, that, that's that been put out there? You know, I've been blessed that it's not, it hasn't been really that, really that many things that's been misconstrued because I kind of stayed out the way, you know? I kind of, I don't put that much out there to give people, I, I let people know what I want them to know. Hmm. You know, I've, I've been really good about kind of staying to myself and keeping my business to myself and just keeping things very, very, uh, 
Trojan horse in it, you know what I'm saying? There's a certain thing that you got to do, you know, to become leading man, to, you know, to be able to have an international draw, to be able to be the best actor I could be so I could be in a position to create my production company, to be able to create more opportunities, more roles for, you know, men, you know, women, you know, people of color, you know, all ethnicities to kind of reverse engineer this whole, you know, seg you know, this prejudice, racist shit, you know huh. what I mean? So you said been, reverse engineer. You have to. You, have to. Mm. you got to you almost accept ideas to people to get them to come to the idea themselves. You can't tell somebody to change the way they think or tell somebody to be something that, you know, they, that they are. You got to you gotta let them come to that decision. You have to help them, you know, think it's their idea. What does diversity mean to you in Hollywood and in general? Diversity means to me that word itself is like such a, you know, such baggage now. Mm. It's like, um, you know, diversity only really makes sense in a system where it's, it, it lacks. If, it, if, if it's not lacking equal opportunity, then there's no need for diversity. It's just, it is what it is. Everybody has an opportunity and it's a balanced um, environment to work, period, um, in the world, in, this, in, in the industry, um, you're taking a, a path, uh, 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 film, that for the longest, since the beginning of film, has been, you know, for white people. Mm. And then slowly allowing other ethnicities to be able to contribute, to be able to tell stories, to be able to act outside of the stereotypes, to just be a regular person. Um, and I think as times change, as people evolve, as things get better, you know, you have civil rights movements, you got certain things that moments in time in history that allow us to get to the point that we are today where you see so many men and women behind the camera. It's not even just, you know, a colored thing. It's, you know, uh, you know, you know, women are getting more and more opportunities, you know, in all different you know, uh, um, lanes, you know, politics, uh, um, you know, education, you know, scientific, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, sports, everything, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's always been, mankind has been evolving over time. So when it comes to, you know, the film industry and, you know, film and television, it's, uh, technology has changed. Hmm. I feel like Anybody can pick up an iPhone now and become, you know, a filmmaker. A, a filmmaker. Yeah. You know, you can make you can make whatever you want to make. So I feel like the fact that technology has evolved, that there's been a thirst. The internet's there. There's there's there's, there's less and less secrets. Everybody's being everything's coming out everywhere about the people that have to be a little bit more honest and address things for what they are. I've noticed that LeBron James, arguably the biggest athlete in the world mm -hmm. has become more outspoken about racism and, mm -hmm. and said just because I'm a successful, wealthy black man doesn't mean I experience it. Do mm -hmm. you agree with what he's, he has been saying? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, he's at a point right now where he feels like, you know, can't nobody take nothing away from him. Mm -hmm. He's got to the point now. He's got it. Mm -hmm. He's got, he's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And now he's finally able to do and say the things that he's probably always thought and wanted to do, but never felt like it, was, it wasn't the right time for him to say and do that because it probably would, it would be cannibalizing himself in a way, but also taking away the best shot at making a real impact. Hmm. Um, hats off to Colin Kaepernick. I mean, I mean, that's a man, you know what I'm saying, who's able to take something that He's done day in and day out since he was a kid, give up his dream, you know? Um, put that on the back burner for the betterment, to make an example, to really start the conversation in a real way again hmm. uh, for everybody. And I think that's, that's super honorable and very important. It could be argued that uh, one of the roles that you played, Oscar Grant, mm -hmm. helped to fuel Colin Kaepernick He's paying a big price right now. How do you yeah. feel when people like him stand up to racism and then they end up paying this price, you know? It was a calculated decision by him. Mm. I feel like it's something that he knew going into it. But it, sending that message meant more to him. Um, and it started this conversation, you know? Um, 
to the point where even the president of the free world right now is forced to address that mm. and make it even a bigger conversation. Yeah. And it's hard to turn away from that other entertainers, uh, um, athletes, artists, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's having to um, look at themselves in the mirror, man, you know, and, and, and really, you know, see what you're going to stand for. Are you going to be quiet or you're not? Are you going to be involved in this or you're not going to? Um, I think everybody have different roles. What's your role? My role, I think, is constantly being defined. But I'm a strategist. I'm a thinker. Um, I want to provide. I want to create opportunities. Um, I want to lead. Um, and I want to bring people together. Mm. And I've been doing that. I got a lot more work to do. And I'm just getting started. I feel like there's a, there's a time and place for everything. Like I said, I'm always 10, 50. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm always seeing 10 steps ahead. I'm, I'm always the guy that's, uh, you know, that's playing the game, you know, but at the same time, you know, you know, but not without compromise, you know what I'm saying? Not, not without, you know, playing the game, but at the same time not compromising myself or, it's it's a compromising myself, meaning like my morals, my values, you know, where I stand, you know, what I believe in, things that I believe in. Those are always going to stay the same. But I know the I know I know the game and the industry that I'm in. Also, you know, I know I know I know how it's played because I've been doing it for two decades. I've been doing it long enough. Um, so you gotta you gotta be smart. You gotta be strategic. You know, and you gotta you gotta. Uh, it's a certain way you got to move, and that's what I've been doing. So, I guess it's sometimes you know you think like you want to do things on your time. You know, in your brain, sometimes you feel like, as a human, you feel like with the simplest things. You know, I want to lose weight. You know, when's, when, when are you going to start doing it? You know, I'm going to do it when the time is right. Mm -hmm. when, when's right? Oh man, you know, my birthday. That's when I'm going to start. Birthday roll around. Still ain't been, you know, you ain't been in the gym, you ain't eating right. No, 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 I'm gonna wait for New Year's. New Year's is when I'm gonna start. Mm. All right, New Year's come around. You know, New Year's resolutions, all that stuff's out the window. When you gonna start again? You know what, I'm gonna wait for the summer. I'm gonna get right for the summer. Yeah, summer, I'm gonna start eating right. And it's, it's never the right time. And I think as a, as a human, sometimes you feel like you always gotta wait for the right time, what makes sense to you to actually start executing, to actually start, stop making excuses, to doing the things that you always really wanted to do. And I'm wow. starting to find myself, you know, and I'm guilty of that. Hmm. And I'm starting to find myself now being like, nah, there is no right time to do anything. You just got to start doing. The year of your film, Black Panther, mm -hmm. is the 10 year anniversary of Barack Obama becoming the first black, first biracial, first multicultural president of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk about race and racism and diversity. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about as this film is hitting the screens? You know, because I grew up with Superman and Batman and Spider Man. I love Spider Man, but you know, I didn't know that there were black superheroes. You mm -hmm. know? What do you think about when you look at where we are, how far we've come since Sydney and Mr. Belafonte, since Mr. Portia and Mr. Belafonte, but also where we are in 2018? Man, I feel like we came a long way. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's the obvious thing, man. We came a long way. 10 years since Obama, man, that's insane. I remember, remember the day he got, in, he got elected. He still got the newspapers. Went out and bought so many newspapers. Um, that was around the time you were about to quit acting. That's exactly where yeah. it was. I was living in Los Feliz. Yeah, I remember that. It's, um... I feel like the time, the time, the time, it's the perfect storm right now, mm. you know? Um, for your movie or for? For everything. Okay. I think it's for, for everything. You know, you got this, just, just okay, even when I talk about the movie, just, just the movie, what it had to take for this movie to actually take place. 
you have to have a director that's successful, right? A black director, you know? And that Ryan, director is? Ryan Coogler. Yeah, Ryan Coogler has had to have a, you know, breakout film of Sundance, breakout film of Cannes, you know, Creed, just to get to the opportunity to be in a conversation to do a movie like Black Panther, you know? However, hundreds of million dollars budget the movie ends up being, whatever, boom, that's got to happen. You got to have a lead actor, like Chadwick Boseman. He has to have all the successes that he had to have from film to film, movie, you know, all the movies that he's done to kind of get to the place he is now. You got to have, you know, me, myself, like the, act, the career, all the things that I had to do to get to a point now where I could play, you know, Eric Killmonger. Lupita, all the things that she had to go through to get to her place, to get to where she's at. Denai, all the successes she had to, you know, Ruth, uh, Ruth Carter, you know, our wardrobe designer, um, you know, uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel um, from uh, Get Out, Kaluuya, Kaluuya, uh, don't kill me, Daniel, I love you. <laughs> I killed last night. Um, for you know all the success that he had to have to kind of be in that role, it had to be this perfect storm to happen. Mm. You know what I'm saying? In order for this movie to take place, and then a studio that felt that you know it was the right time to back, you know, a, 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 a film um, that's with a predominantly black cast that hasn't been done before at this budget. You know what I'm saying? That they felt comfortable enough that it was gonna, you know, make an impact, make a statement, and make money. Because this is a business, you know what I'm saying? And dollar, and it is about money, you know what I'm saying? This is a business. And I want to, like, a lot of people don't really realize that it, is, it takes so much to happen for a movie to take place. So many things have had to conspire to happen to get how many, however many hundreds of people that it takes to kind of come together and make a movie. It's not a song where you can go in there, one person can go in there and do whatever, whatever, make the beat, this, this, put a song out, and everybody loves it, lives forever. You know what I'm saying? We don't have that ability to do when it comes to filmmaking. You know, it's a different type of thing. So I feel like it's the right, that movie was the right time. Mm. How important is this film? Why is it important? I think, I think, it's, I think it's extremely important. I feel like, um, I never had that many actors to look at to, be, to inspire me growing up. You mean black actors? Black actors. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like that I can identify with that looks like me on screen. Hmm. You know, I used to see all these other films, you know, growing up and I would automatically try to imagine myself. Yeah, I would be playing make-believe and stuff like that, you know, X-Men and all this other cartoons and stuff like that, you know, you, but it's a totally different thing. You know, I watch Blade. You know what I'm saying? I see Wesley up there and I'm like, oh man, that's dope. I could, that's awesome. I don't gotta try that hard to imagine because I'm seeing somebody that kind of, you know what I'm saying, that kind of mm -hmm. resembles me. And I'm just thinking about what I'm doing, what this movie's gonna do to the younger generation, the kids growing up. I'm so, Which kids? Black kids? White black kids, kids? All kids? White kids, all kids, you okay. know what I'm saying? But at the same time, because they can imagine just as much as we can, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but specifically, it's black and brown kids, you yeah. know what I'm saying? That, that, don't that have that many positive examples to look at on TV and film, you know? So we're giving black people in power, royalty? We're royalty? We come from good stuff? We ain't gotta be the crackhead or the gangbanger? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're selling drugs or the dope or robbing people or, you know, the comic relief and mm -hmm. this and that. We ain't gotta be just that. We can do other stuff. We can do this. You can be superheroes. We can be superheroes. Oh man, that's crazy. Now imagine what that's gonna do to the imagination and the ambitions of these kids growing up that's watching these movies. And that and that's what I feel like is super important. You know what I mean? That that's what I feel like is is the, the real impact of this film's gonna be. Um and also, you know, and it's not just for black and brown kids, you know, it's a movie that's because this is what I'm saying, it's like when you watch Star Wars or um, you know, or Lord of the Rings, I'm, I'm a big fan. I watch them just all the time, you know, I love it. And I'm able to go there and fantasize and think about what it would be like in those in that world with dragons and, 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 and you know, hobbits and all this other creation. I mean, that's awesome, I enjoy it. Harry Potter, all that stuff is amazing. I, I am a big fan, huge. I hear a butt coming. No, it's no real, but, 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 when, but when it's a, a predominantly black hmm. cast, Everybody wants to act like, you know, or project that it's only for black audiences. But like, why? Why? Why is that? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. 
why can't the same, you know, everybody else look at this movie and still be inspired and still fantasize and still go on for that journey? They should be able to do that. And, and if you can't, then that's the problem. It seems like you're saying that The Last Frontier is Hollywood because people look up to LeBron of all races. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you for a fact that where I've been in the world, people worship Tupac, all races, all Without cultures, a doubt. and hip hop in general. Without a doubt. What is it about film, TV, Hollywood that this is like one of the places, thank you, one of the places. You. Good look. No, the, oh. Yeah, yeah, you gotta go back to it. Okay. Yeah, I got you. I what got is you. it about, <laughs> what is it about this being the last frontier, you mm -hmm. know, why is it these images are the hardest thing to penetrate and, and why you want to do the work that you do going forward and producing? I think because when it comes to sports, athletically, we push the culture. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, we've always been, you know, physically right there at the top of the food chain. Mm. Um, music, uh, very creative push the culture of music, a lot, you know, hip hop, culture, um, R&B, jazz, blues, always been, you know, pretty much at the top of the food chain. Push the culture, influence cultures, um, trendsetters. When it comes to, and they, something that, you know, that, it's a solo, it's a solo journey sometimes, you know, as an as a, you know, athlete, you know, you. Practice by yourself, do what you gotta do, you know what I'm saying? Get on a team, you can break boundaries, you can do that. You know, it's, you can you have control over your own self, your own body, you can do that. When it comes to film, there's so many other components that has to go into making a film, a movie, hmm. in order to get people to kind of buy into going into paying this ticket to go see this thing that's gonna recoup everybody that spent their time to make this movie. Um, and I think that's one of the major reasons why it took so long to get to where we are now. It's, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a slow, it's a slower burn, it's a slower process. Yeah. Um, just for what it is as film. Um, and then having the opportunity, you know, like going to, you know, having funds to go buy a ticket to go to the movies and be able to contribute and go, you know, it, it was a different, it was a different, it was a different time. Like I said, that's why I said the timing's everything. Ten years for, you know, like I said, since Obama been in, off, in office, it's been I don't know how many years since, you know, the Black Panther comic book has come out to, to where it is today. It, it's, it has to be the perfect storm right now that we're having this conversation about diversity in Hollywood. It's one of the, like you said, one of the last frontier, frontiers, last industries that's kind of really starting to break those barriers, not just from a color thing, but even from, you know, you know, a woman empowerment, you know, uh, perspective as well. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great time. It's, it's an amazing time. And, and, uh, and the internet and technology has a lot to do with that also. My last question, because you've mentioned women a few times, and I get a feeling that you, you, you mentioned your mother a lot, you mentioned women a lot in this conversation. Yeah. Hashtag Me Too has exploded. Hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts as a man, you know, about what's going on? Into my industry, yeah, just I mean, I, sexism in general. I mean, I think it's just a cleansing. I think it's a power thing. Mm. You know, I, you know, and that's in all industries. Mm. You know, I feel like whenever there's power and there's men in power, there's going to be an abuse of power. That's human nature. Mm. I think that's just what it is. Um, I feel like the conversation is how do we hold people accountable and responsible for having that power? Um, and it's a cleansing going on right now. Um, an old way of doing things, an old, uh, a old way of uh, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. The uh, culture of Hollywood is changing now on all levels, behind the camera, in front of the camera. And whenever there's a, a change, you know, whenever there's a, a shift in any power or a shift in, um, in culture, it's going to be rough at first. It's going to be jarring. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty intense. And we're going through that stage right now on a lot of different, on a lot of different levels. So I think it's needed and it's necessary and I'm glad it's coming out, you know, and I'm, ve and I'm very, you know, and empathetic and very, uh, to women, to women, mm. you know, um, and men, you know, to whoever, it's kids too, man, you know what I'm saying? Um, 
who's been put in compromising situations, uh, you know, it's tough, you know, but at the same time, it has to happen. You know, this, this has to happen to get this out there because now you have to hold people accountable. Now there's a fear because you know, people are, 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 that were scared or afraid to say or speak their truth now are feeling more comfortable about coming out and, 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 and saying what's on their mind. And I think that's gonna keep a lot of people honest. It's gonna keep people f fear of trying to use power, use their power for, 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 for bad and not for, for not for good. People are gonna be a little bit more responsible with the positions that they're in right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's taught down. You know, the assistants that are coming up, you know, but, you know, the producers that are, you know, around, the, the actors that are coming up, everybody's learning from this right now. Everybody's learning, everybody's learning. So, you know, the next crop, that's what you gotta do. You just gotta like, sometimes you gotta like weed these motherfuckers out, you know? So the next crop that come up can learn the right way, mm. how to do things. So when they do get in positions of power, and you know, when they do get in those positions, they can continue that, 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 that blueprint. They can continue that, the right way of doing things, they could pass that on to the next generation and they can come up. And if we can keep passing on the right thing and sending the right messages to these kids growing up, then we can, we can start seeing real changes in the world. You know, that's the same thing with it's, it's education. You know, that, that's, 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 the, that's the issue right now. We have a lot of old way of thinking across the board in the world right now. We have a whole lot of old way of doing things that they used to get away with a lot. And now these kids, now they're not as dumb as they, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're not, they're not, actually not as dumb as they used to be, but they're not as gullible and they're naive. They have access to information. They can see things for themselves. They can learn more, you know, and now, and now, and they're, and they're calling people to help. Mm. You're a leader? Very much so. Why? Because I have to be. Like Malcolm, like Martin, like the Black Panthers? I'm a mixture of both. Huh. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of Malcolm, a little bit of Martin. You know, you gotta have moments, you gotta be smart. You know, there's, mo there's moments where you gotta be a little bit more like Martin, and there's, and there's moments where, you know, you have to be like Malcolm. Hmm. 